Good morning. This first Sunday of Advent, the theme is In the Meantime. In the Meantime. You guys had the pleasure of hearing the reading today, Luke 21, 25 through 36. Um, the gift of Advent this year is that we will be in the Gospel of Luke uh, for all four Sundays of Advent. Many of you have, who have been down this road many times know that often each year your focus tends to fall in one of the Gospels and that the Gospels have a subtle difference in how they um, experience the presence of Jesus and were written at different times. Every now and then we have people who come obsessed. They just become obsessed with the end of the world. Every now and then we get someone who predicts with certainty that they have the date for the end of the world. And their few followers sell all their possessions and get ready to go bye-bye. A couple of decades ago, artist Prince came out with such a theme called the sign of the times. And his lyrics went something like this. Hurricane Annie ripped the ceiling of a church and killed everyone inside. You turn on the telly and every other story is telling you somebody died. A sister killed her baby because she couldn't afford to feed it. And yet we're sending people to the moon. In September, my cousin tried Rifa for the very first time. Now he's doing horse, it's June. Times, times. A sign of the times mess with your mind. Hurry before it's too late. Do you hear it? This sense that the world is coming to an end based on what is happening around us. In the Bible, we have different genres. We have the books that relate to the law. We have books that relate to wisdom literature and psalms and prophecy and the gospels and the acts of apostle and the epistles. And we even have books that relate to what is called apocalyptic literature. Today in one of the four gospels, the one we're reading from Luke, this text, relates to apocalyptic content. I know that many of you already know what the word means, but for the sake of uniformity, it refers to the end of times, the end of the age as revealed by an angel or other heavenly messengers. In this first Sunday of Advent, we are focusing on waiting. We are waiting for Jesus to return. And the text tells us to wait for the signs, and then there will be chaos then the kingdom of God is near. So we should watch and stay woke. Pay attention to yourselves, the text tells us. I believe there's a problem with signs. You see, all the way back to the Bible days, there have been signs. Yes, even the disciples were waiting for Jesus' return. And generation after generation, we have been waiting so long, I think we forgot we were waiting. If Jesus appeared, some of us would be probably just a tad bit shocked because we really weren't waiting. We have gone on with our lives. We are doing us. We are living it up. We are trying to be comfortable. How many of you have been waiting for Jesus to return? I know this sounds like I'm bordering on something here. Thank you, Denise. I haven't. And if I can be bold, it doesn't even look like Jesus is coming, except there are the signs, all the signs around us that have been around us from generation to generation. COVID, division, wars, carjackings, gun shootings, fear, hatred, polarization, capitalism. You can't miss the signs, especially since we are supposed to be staying woke. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth distress among nations every generation. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heaven will be shaken every generation. Luke's Jesus, assure, 
Luke's Jesus assures us that this will not only happen to a few, but for the whole world. What is more, that day is surely, surely coming. So you see, we have had all kinds of signs around us, but when I was a kid, there were signs. And before I was born, there were signs. There have always been signs threatening to unravel us. And yet these signs have always, always been there. And so Luke, written years after Mark, is not as urgent about the return of Jesus. Instead, he focuses on what to do in the meantime, what to do when you're waiting, but not waiting. Since Jesus hasn't returned, what shall we do today? What do we do in the meantime? How can we continue to be faithful when the days look short and bleak? Amongst all the signs that we see around us, and I'm sure if I invited you all to participate, you could come up with even more signs. I say to you all, we are in the midst of holding on to what is given to us this first Sunday, hope. In the meantime, we can hold on to hope and we can build. Years ago, I think I was shocked to learn that the infrastructure of our road system was crumbling. Almost half of our roads are in mediocre to poor condition. Well, in Chicago, I think that's like 90%, no. Our roads allow the movement of people and goods. Um, being in other countries, I see how the condition of roads make travel even longer. Poor roads impact our travel. They also cost us. They bring wear and tear to our cars. I know this from personal experience. One night after my son's swim meet, I went cruising down a side street. It was dark, and before I knew it, I had ran over a big hole in the road. Immediately, my tire went out. That driving over the hole in the middle of the road led to over $2,000 of repairs to my car over a period of six months. And I knew the city wasn't gonna pay me back, though I wanted them to pay me back. I had heard other stories of people submitting claims, but it's so much larger than me. What I have noticed is this notion that our roads are in bad shape. There is a lot more construction going on. Have you noticed in the last 10 years, sometimes it seems like everywhere you go, there's construction going on. We are working on building our infrastructure to support our road system. But it has taken years and years of work with so many more years to go. The infrastructure of our civilization is crumbling. I was reading this article by a woman who became the chair of the parent group of her school district in the Midwest. Things were going great. She was new, she ran for office, and two years later, she was promoted to being the chair. And then COVID came. She was happy and she loved working on the infrastructure that supported all the kids' education. But like I said, COVID came. And then some parents wanted masks, and guess what? Some parents did not. And it was almost like it was split down the middle. And the discussion became more and more heated and parents became angrier. And then before she knew it, people were coming for her transgender daughter. And it got ugly, and it got uglier. And now she finds herself with her child at risk, packing up to move again. Something is gravely wrong when we cannot exist in the tension of differences. When our beliefs cause us to go after innocent kids, when my son started school, they had already begun to work on the highway downtown that connects 94 to 290. It has been at least seven years and they're still not done. But I see work and I see progress. And in seeing what has been done already, I hope. There was congestion and rerouting. There's a lot of days of slow traffic, but I still had hope because I knew that when they got done, we would have something much better that the infrastructure of the roads would be better. 
parts have been sh finished, and what we now have looks so much better. I take pride in driving in that area. But it began with plans and lots of dust and lots of equipment and construction and prep work and lots and lots of labor. In the meantime, we hold on to hope and we build new roads where old roads no longer serve us. We build new relationships. We build new ways of relating to others. We've even built new ways of having worship in the midst of COVID. We have a hybrid church where some people are in this location, some people are here, and we don't even all gather at the same time. Recently, I went to Benihana for the five corps meal they serve. I love Benihana, not because the food is just so wow, but because it feeds my soul. You never know who you're gonna sit next to when you're at Benihana but you know that you have no choice about the people that are gonna end up at your table. Oftentimes, if you're small enough, you're seated by strangers. And on this day, when I went a couple months ago, we, we were seated by people we didn't know. They were there for a business expo and had come all the way from Texas, 40 miles south of Dallas. These were serious 200% Republican kind of Texans. And they sat down, they had the drawl, they did the prayer, and they began to talk. And this, for the first time, was a weird experience because we did not talk at all. This was strange because we always have conversations with strangers at Benihana. And I could feel my stereotypes pressing against my mind as now I was seated at the table with people who perhaps felt very different and they felt like there were no roads. We had eaten our food successfully, not speaking to one another at all. Not so much as even a hello. After the meal was over, the oldest in their party and the one on the end, the one that was closest to me, started talking to me. And the remaining 15 minutes changed us. Here was this 75-year-old man saying, ma'am this and ma'am that. And he explained to me how they ended up at Benihana, of all places. He said the last time he came to Chicago, he was seven years old, and his parents took the whole family to Benihana, seven years old and 75. And so that evening when they said, where shall we eat dinner? He said he remembered Benihana. We didn't talk about the presidency, and we didn't talk about masks, and we didn't talk about vaccination. I promise you we did not. But for a few minutes, we experienced each other's humanity. And at the end of the dinner experience, this elderly man who kept calling me ma'am said he wanted to pay my entire dinner bill. Well, that made everyone awkward. The waitress tried to stop him. His friends there were looking at him like he had grown two heads. And he didn't stutter. And he repeated himself. I wondered why others felt so awkward with this gesture. It was clear they didn't want him to pay. And I felt a little shaken by the experience myself. And I told him it wasn't necessary because if I was at Benihana, I had the money, right? <laughs> and he said to me, words that have stayed with me since that day, if you can't be of service to another human being, ma'am, you ain't worth much. Somewhere in Enos, Texas, I have a brother I pray for him with tears and words and spirit. I remember him. He broke through a wall. Humans created in the image of God, losing all the pretentiousness that we are clothed in. In the meantime, we can build bridges and roads to each other. It's going to take a while to build bridges to one another, but I have hope. It's all we have in the face of the signs all we have is our God and each other. In the meantime, I have hope that the wolf and the lamb shall sit together. In the meantime, I have hope that people who feel differently about vaccinations can be civil to one another. In the meantime, I have hope that in these difficult times, we can move outside of our bubbles to embrace other. I have hope that we can build tables where strangers can sit and share a meal. 
I have hope that we can fight against capitalism that makes everything about profit and less about people. I have hope that we can shine our light for one who has lost their way. And I also have hope that we can receive the light when we are lost ourselves. I have hope that we can rebuild because our democracy is crumbling. Hope is the one thing that can help us really get through these hard times. So I really hope, I really hope that we can hold on to hope. Today in the Emmanuel song, and this is where I'd like to end, were these words that Jade sang. Oh, come and be the hope in all our lives. Though chaos and confusion still survive, we know the path of hate all too well. We need our God with us. Emmanuel, rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to us, and all things shall be well. In the meantime, let us, let all of God's creation, hold on tightly to hope. Amen.